want to talk to us today for a little while on the topic platinum or plastic. Amen. You know how the grocery store will ask, well they used to ask you, nowadays they won't even ask you. But back when I was a little bit younger and plastic grocery bags first come out, they used to ask you, plastic or paper? Do you want paper or plastic? And uh, you had to make a choice. Well today, I'm asking the question, platinum or plastic? Amen. If you'll join me in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 through 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 through 26. Amen. I'm going to put it up on the screen for those in the house of the Lord today. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 19 through 26 I read today from the King James text. And the word of the Lord reads, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Amen. Again this afternoon, I'm asking the question, platinum? Or plastic. Will you bow your heads with me one more moment? Master, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as it is our privilege as children of God. We come before you crying, Abba, Father, for Lord, today you are our caring caregiver, our loving Father. Master, the Word of God is the most important element of any worship service. A lot of times we become distracted by things like music and choirs and musicians and all the accoutrements of worship. But oh God, today my entire life I have known that the Word of God is so much more important than any of these things. I don't care what the preacher sounds like. I don't care what the singer sound like. Let the Word of God ring true. Let the anointing flow. Let the Holy Ghost and power accompany the preaching of the Gospel. Anoint today, O oh God, your messenger. I cannot possibly disseminate to the people of God the Word that you've given me for the church at this hour. Without the anointing and the touch of the Holy Ghost, touch me, help me, O oh God, to deliver your word in a fashion that will bring glory and honor to your name. Quicken my feeble lips of clay. Allow the ear of every hearer to be open. Lord, let it not be open merely to the hearing, nor to the mind, not even the heart. But let it be open today right to the deepest part of our soul, right to our spirit, that the Word of God going forth might affect change in our lives for the better, that we might walk a better testimony, live a better example of what it is to be a child of God. We ask all this and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name, Amen. Praise God and amen. amen. I'm well aware that the message that we preach from this pulpit is a good bit different than the message preached from most Pentecostal pulpits. 
Most Pentecostal pulpits are going to preach a message that approaches things, quite frankly, from a legalistic perspective. It's going to come at you with, here's what you need to do. Here's what you have to do. This is what you're required to do if you're going to be saved. And the emphasis tends to be more on our works and what we're capable of than it is on the grace of God. Well, I got mm -hmm. news for you. That's not the message we preach. Mm -hmm. We believe the message of the gospel is rooted in the grace of God. In our primary text today, the writer Paul makes the declaration, in a great house, there are vessels of a variety of materials. Some of those materials are valuable, and some of those materials are less valuable. Some of those materials are durable, and some of those materials are less durable. Some of those materials are, in fact, uh, quite dainty and easily broken, while others are not so easily broken. While fine china may be pleasant to use for special occasions and family events, it's entirely impractical for daily use. The dishes we use uh, day to day are generally those which are made of far less valuable and precious materials. But just because they are not of the same quality and the same value as the more expensive china, they are nonetheless a part of the household and used regularly. Am I telling the truth? Yes, yes. Amen. Around our house, I love to eat cereal. I'm a big cereal eater. I also love to eat soup. Well, the bowl that I use... It's this bowl right here. I don't want to use fine china. I don't want to go to the dining room and pull out the china that we use for special occasion. No, I need something durable. I need something I can drop. I need something that isn't going to break and tear up if I happen to be a little rough with it. Amen. So what we use daily tends to be less valuable. It tends to be less expensive. It tends to be more durable. It's a different material. It may be plastic. It's not platinum. Amen. It's not bone china. Now, I don't know anybody that owns platinum dishes, but I've seen such things online. I've seen gold uh, chargers, you know, the big plates that are made out of gold, you know, and silver. So I'm sure if they've got gold ones and silver ones, they'll probably have platinum ones as well. And I'm sure that people like Mr. Trump would just die to have platinum plates to eat off of. Somehow that would make him feel more important and more powerful and more special. But you know, in the end, a plate is a plate. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Amen. Mm -hmm. My Lord have mercy. Items of various material have their own unique qualities. They have their own benefits. And they have their own advantages. In some instances, using fine china would be very ill-advised. Just as sometimes it is unwise to use glass drinkware when plastic drink vessels might be far more practical, am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven is described by the Apostle Paul uh, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 as a great house. And I believe today that this description, this phraseology, is not at all done by accident. In John chapter 14 and 2, even the Lord Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks. In a great house, in a large, well-to-do property. See, the, the writer had to say in a great house because... In a small house or in a poor house, you're not going to have a variety of materials, no. Right. Poor folks have that one set of dishes, and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. If it's plastic, it's plastic. If it's earthenware, it's earthenware. And whatever it might be, if it's hand-me-down china, it's hand-me-down china. But in a great house, in a house of wealth and substance, you're going to find a... Uh, items of all kinds of materials and all kinds of values and you're going to find uh, items that serve different purposes and have different functions and therefore it is important that they be made of different materials you know it's sad today that so many of the church cannot appreciate that in the house of God, in the household of our God, there's a lot of different kind of people. There's a lot of different kind of believers. There's a lot of different kind of saints. We're all not made out of the same material. We're not all the same quality. But we all have a purpose. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that today? Mm -hmm. Amen. I want to tell you, when I look at some of <clears throat> my mentors in the faith, when I look at some of the people in the church over the years who have played a great role in my life, pastors that I've had, and uh, uh, men like Brother Gillum, of course, and Brother Tatlock, I don't even consider myself to be in the same category as Brother Tatlock. I don't, I don't consider myself to be in the same category as Brother and Sister Gillum. You know what I'm saying? I don't consider myself to be in the same category as Sister Davis, bless her soul. You know, these are saints that to me uh, were, were walking on the cusp of perfection. You know, Now, if I got to know them well enough, I'm sure I'd see the chinks in their armor. If I spend enough time with them, if I spend time with them at home, you know, I'm likely to find things that would help me to realize that maybe they're not platinum, but they may still be gold or silver, amen. They still may be good bone china, but they may not be as wonderful as I otherwise think them to be. But you know, the Word of God said that we ought to prefer one another above ourselves. We ought to be able to look at believers and saints around us and think more highly of them than we do ourselves. Oh my goodness, a lot of people, I said that and they're thinking, well, how in the world do you do that? Well, it's called humility is what it is. <laughs> Amen. If you can humble yourself. See, that's the problem. How many Christians in the church you know sit around looking around the room when they're in church and they're going... Earthenware, plastic, paper, <laughs> plastic, melamine. Yeah, I see Corel over here. You follow what I'm telling you now? Oh, they look around the room, boy, and they just think they know the quality and the level of spirituality of every person in that room. You know what the only problem is? You haven't lived their life. You know what the only problem is? You haven't gone through their experiences. Honey, what they are is the byproduct of what they're made up of. Am I telling mm -hmm. the truth? What they are is the byproduct of what has been put into them in the process of their being created. Amen. Mm -hmm. You and I today are the byproduct of a lifetime of experience. Right. We're, we're the byproduct of all kinds of hurts and pains. We're the byproduct of all kinds of teaching and training. We're the byproduct of all kinds of examples mm -hmm. which have been set for us. 
And there are many choices we make daily. There are many things we do that are based upon all this input, you know, all these things that have been contributed to our makeup. We cannot control. We have no control over what we're made of. We have no control over that at all. Brother Gillum, unlike me, was soft-spoken. Just, I mean, Brother Gillum, bless his heart, he was just the coolest, the most smooth, you know, the most easygoing, well, how you doing there, Chuck, you know, just, and Brother King and Sister King, you know, real soft-spoken and all that. I often wonder what kind of house they grew up in. I often wonder what their parents were like, you know, and I grew up in a house where I hate to tell you, we were a loud bunch of people. <laughs> my whole family, on my mother's side especially, is the loudest bunch of folks you ever met. And they're opinionated out of their minds. Oh my goodness. And don't tell me I'm opinionated because frankly I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. Believe me, there are many, many times, like even on Facebook and on Twitter and stuff, there are many, many times when I get the bug and I want to write something, you know, and I'll think about it for a minute and I'll say, now, Charles, you really don't need to put that out there. That may be how you feel. That may be how you think. But... Your opinion is not necessary, amen. Keep it to yourself. There are many times I've learned in my life to keep my opinions to myself. But I come from a family where, let me tell you something, that is not the common practice. I come from a family where if you had 20 people in the room and my mother had nine siblings, there were 10 children including her, and uh, if my aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents were all in the room, let me tell you, every one of them was barking their opinion like it was the only opinion in the world. Every one of them talked like they were right and everybody else was wrong. And quite frankly, I can do that. And honestly, I know that I can do that. It frustrates me that I can be that way sometimes. But what makes me who I am is not my doing. Come on now. What makes you who you are is not your doing. You didn't set up in the sky somewhere and pick your parents and say, I like these people. These are good people. These are godly living church people, know how to pray, know how to worship. Oh, look at mom there. She shouts and runs the aisles and hallelujah. Oh, they look like a good family to be born into. I think I'll go that route. No, ain't no one of us that had that option. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Some of us were born to parents uh, you know, I, I'm not going to get too specific in, in this, but uh, some of us had fathers who were hateful and nasty and never met anybody they ever liked who ran down their wife and ran down their children. Some of us were born into abusive homes, physical abuse, psychological abuse, spiritual abuse. There's all kinds of experiences that people are born into. And it always amazes me how believers feel comfortable sitting in judgment of one another, and they don't think twice. They don't even for a second stop to consider what made this person who they are. And if that person comes to church every Sunday, if that person does their best to live for the Lord, and to try to serve God and try to make heaven their home and see Jesus one day, who am I? To sit in judgment of them. They may not be platinum. They may be plastic. Oh, listen to me, children. But plastic still can serve a purpose. That's right. God can still use plastic. Yes, amen. I had a family member many, many years ago. I always looked up to her. She's a Pentecostal lady. 
uh, I always looked up to her. I always thought very highly of her. I always had the highest possible opinion of her. Uh, if you'd have asked me when I was a young person what quality believer she was, I probably would have said, uh, she's silver, she's gold, you know, she's right up there at the top. And then as a teenager, I had the opportunity to live with this family member. Ooh. You know, there's an old saying, you don't know somebody until you live with them. I'm telling the truth. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Tommy, I begin to see the chinks in the armor. All of a sudden, I begin to see things that my occasional time with her over the years never just were never on display and all of a sudden I'm realizing that this lady is so much less I hate to say it this way but she is so much less a quality of believer and child of God than I had her you know for many many years uh, in my mind but she would say some of the most hurtful things. She'd do some of the most hurtful things. She, oh Lord have mercy, Tommy, I'm telling you, that lady visited some pain on my life. And not me only, but any number of people, you know. She, she had certain quirks that I'm certain were the byproduct of her upbringing. They were the byproduct of what had been incorporated into her growing up and becoming who she is. And... Yet we would go to church and bless her heart. She'd shout all over the church and she'd dance all over the church. And it would be easy. Let me rephrase that. It would have been easy for me to just sit in judgment of her and say, well, what a hypocrite. You know, she don't even. Do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. You know what? She's doing the best she can with what she's got. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, she may drive me up the wall, and I may prefer not to have too much to do with her, you know, because honestly, having a lot of interaction with her caused a lot of grief and pain, to be frank. But, I recognize, listen to me, children, that in a great house, there are vessels of gold and of silver, and of wood. Hello now. Mm -hmm. I recognize that there's a variety of materials and there's a variety of workmanship. But in the end, everybody's walk with God is their own. I have not been called to sit in judgment of them. I have not been called to put my stamp on them as to what quality or what material I believe that they exemplify. That's not my job. That's not my calling. I'm called to love. I'm called to encourage. As Tommy read in our Declaration of Purpose today, the scripture afterwards from Romans, we're not to put a stumbling block in front of anybody. That's right. So as long as they're trying, even if it looks like they're failing miserably, as long as they're trying, leave them alone. It's God who is working in them. It's God who is working it out with them. Let God be God. Amen. My Lord have mercy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 25. The word of the Lord tells us, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? 
if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, listen, which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. What is Paul telling us in 1 Corinthians 12? He's saying, in every great house. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Amen. He is telling us today, in every great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. It's the same concept, but it's stated differently. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Not all members of the body serve the same purpose. There may be believers of different materials and workmanship, but so long, listen to me children, but so long as they have been sanitized, oh hallelujah, and washed by faith in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary, they are in a position to be used of God. I've seen people who were... Trying to think of the best way to say this. Probably, uh, this isn't probably the best way, but it's the only way I can think to say it. I know people who are probably about the worst Christian living people I've ever seen, but they call themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, one of them was my own grandfather. Now, I love my grandfather. But my grandfather did not walk a victorious Christian life. He had a lot of issues. He had a lot of trouble in his life, a lot of things. But you know, it's so funny because he could cuss like a sailor's parrot. He smoked like a chimney. Now, I know some of you homeless people are losing your teeth. You're, you're going to have a fit when I actually say what I'm about to say. He just didn't look like what many of us believe a Christian ought to look like. But you know something, Tommy? One time my grandfather was in the hospital, and he had a roommate. He had another man in the hospital with him. And one day my grandmother came in to visit my grandfather in the hospital. And my grandfather had tears coming down his face. My grandma said, Don, what's wrong? What's wrong? And Grandpa said, I just prayed with that man in the bed next to me. He wanted to ask the Lord into his life. He wanted to ask God to save him and to forgive him. And my grandfather was so thrilled. He was so happy. See, in that hospital bed, he wasn't the cuss a lunatic that he could be in other places. And there's not a one of us that is the same identical person no matter where we are under what circumstances, That's you know. Right. At home, we're the same person we are at work. Right. And at church, we're the same person we are at home. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? No. Mm -hmm. Every one of us, uh, our personalities, you know, change. 
a bit as we get into this environment or as we get into that environment. And of course, when we come to church, we always put on our best, you know, uh, our, we put up our best front. You know, we, we look as good as we could possibly look because we don't want to look foolish in front of other believers. We don't want to look foolish in front of the rest of the family, as it were. Now, to one of us, it's the same everywhere we are. But you know, it's funny because my grandfather may have been made out of the most crusty old earthenware. He might have been the most easily broken dish in the house. But I'm going to tell you something about my grandpa. I know that man believed this gospel. I know he did. I don't have a doubt in my mind that my grandfather put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, it's funny because it's our faith that allows us to stand righteous before God. Not our behavior, not our conduct, our faith. Righteousness is by faith according to the Word of God. God could use my grandpa. Mm-hmm. The factory that my grandfather worked in, I found out, somebody told me once, said, do you know what your grandfather's nickname is at the factory? I said, no. He said, Rev. I said, I'll be a son of a gun. That's the same nickname they gave me when I was in high school. Everybody used to call me Rev, you know. My grandfather's nickname at work was Rev. Did my grandfather carry on and scream and holler and yell and, and have the same personality at work that he had at home? Maybe not. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Maybe not. Because he could be very calm. He could be very collected. He could be very kind and very sweet and, you know, all of these things. But the truth of the matter is that as long as a dish has been washed, as long as a dish has been sanitized by faith in the accomplished work of the Lord at Calvary, then that dish can be used by God. Am I yes. telling the truth? Yes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9-11, through 11, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to what Paul writes. And such were some of you. Mm -hmm. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. Hmm. We're washed. We're sanctified. We're justified. What? By our conduct? By our actions? No. No. By the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In Ephesians 5 verses 25 through 27 the writer Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Listen. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Who on earth am I to sit in judgment of anyone who is sincerely trying to live for God, anyone who's sincerely trying to be a child of God and live the Christian life, they may fail miserably. They may have more faults than Carter has liver pills. They may not be anywhere near the quality or the level of maturity or what have you, uh, materials and, and workmanship that I might think a child of God ought to have. But you know what? There is no single standard Oh my God, listen to me children. There is no single standard 
for all believers. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Of course I'm telling the truth. How do I know? Because in a great house, there are victuals of all kinds of materials. Some expensive, some costly, some breakable, some more durable, but a whole lot cheaper. In a body, there's members that are highly respected and honored and appreciated, like eyes and ears. But then there's also parts of the body that don't get anywhere near the recognition that they're not nearly as, as highly thought of, but they're every bit as important. Right, yes. I have a cousin by marriage years ago. He was involved in an accident at a, a, a factory that he was inspecting and, and walking through. He didn't work in the factory, but he was walking through and doing some sort of an inspection or what have you. And a huge, cra a huge uh, crate or something fell off of a, a lift and it fell literally on his foot and it wound up taking about two or three of his toes and they had to amputate them. We don't think about our toes. Our toes are the last thing in the universe we think about, you know, when we're concerned about our health and we're concerned about our well-being, the last thing in the world we think about are our toes. Now, we think about our fingers a whole lot quicker. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're doing something and, and you put your finger somewhere where you might cut a finger off. You sure pull it back fast because you sure don't want to lose a finger. But you know what? People are a whole lot more careless when it comes to where they put their feet. I remember years ago when I was a kid, my father was out mowing the lawn one day with a riding mower and all of a sudden I heard him screaming and hollering and he was always screaming and hollering about something. So I just thought, oh Lord, somebody left a toy in the yard or something, you know. All of a sudden he'd come in the house and he looked right at me and he was just screaming and hollering and carrying on. And I didn't know what on earth happened. I didn't know what was going on. And I was so used to him just constantly yelling and griping about something that I literally just turned around and walked away. And then my mother come down and said, I've called the ambulance. Your father cut his foot with the lawnmower. He put his foot under the lawnmower uh, cover. And it literally sliced right through his toe sideways like this. I felt horrible, you know, that I hadn't paid attention, that I didn't understand what he was screaming and hollering about. But, you know, we're so much more careless with our feet than we are with our hands, am I telling the truth? Because we don't we don't really think about how valuable our toes are. If anything, if we do pull our foot back, it's not because we're worried about how valuable our feet are so much, oh I don't want to hurt. You know, I don't want to hurt myself, right? But my cousin lost a couple of toes and he wound up having to go through months and months of rehab in order to learn how to walk again. Because every toe plays a role in our maintaining balance mm -hmm. and walking and moving. Oh my goodness, all of a sudden my cousin Johnny realized, my Lord, let me tell you, you don't realize how important your toes are, but they are extremely important. And yet, you know what? They're, most of the time they're covered. Most of the time they're invisible to the world. Most of the time nobody sees them. They're not anything we run around putting rings on and, you know, showing off or anything. We don't, uh, we men anyway, generally don't paint our toenails and what have you. I know some that do. But do you follow what I'm trying to say today? Mm -hmm. But does that make them any less important? Of no. course not. Of course not. They're still every bit as important as any other part of the body. In Romans 3, 23 through 27, the Apostle Paul once again writes, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's talking about we believers, folks. The world, sinners, unbelievers are not trying to glorify God in their living. Mm -mm. So when he says, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, he's talking about saints. 
He said, being justified freely by His grace, unmerited favor, unearned favor, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. Mm -hmm. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I'm so glad that I was born during the dispensation of grace. Because, oh, yes. honey, if I'd have been born under the dispensation of law, I surely would have missed it every which way but upside down. Mm -hmm. In Romans 5, 1 and 2, Paul writes, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope, listen, of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory. So we're looking forward to one day attaining that place where we are not short of the glory mm -hmm. of God. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Oh my Lord. But how do we get there? We get there by faith. Hallelujah. In Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable, the most important three words in the Bible I'm about to read. To present you holy and un unblameable and unreprovable, listen to the next three words, in His sight. Hallelujah. Oh, you may not look holy unreprovable. You may not look unblameable in the sight of others. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you do in His. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you do in His. Yes. Hallelujah. And I got news for you, children. The only one that matters is Him. Glory to God. If your faith's in place, if you trust in His grace, if you're believing God to keep the promises of His Word, then by faith you're justified. By faith you stand righteous before God. And by faith you stand holy, unreprovable, unblameable in His sight. If, Paul, uh, Paul writes, ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Got news for you, children. Judgment will one day come. Mm -hmm. And the Lord alone will be the judge. In 1 Peter 1, 17-21, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, 
pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Oh, I'm going to tell you, so many believers got this thing all messed up. Their faith and hope is in how high they can pile their hair. Right. Their faith and hope is in how long their sleeves are. Uh -huh. Their faith and hope is in whether or not they chew tobacco or they smoke cigarettes or they drink alcohol. No, 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 honey. Our faith and hope is in faith. Hallelujah. Yes. It, that our faith and hope is in God. In Revelation 20, 11 through 13, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Judgment will come. And God alone will be the judge. Now let's make clear who's going to be doing that judging. In Revelation 21, 5 through 7. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Glory to God. Amen. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10, the word of God declares, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. In Matthew 16, 27, the Lord Jesus Christ declared, For we must, excuse me, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his, his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Say, Pastor, I don't quite get the purpose of this message. This message ought to encourage us because it helps us to realize that we may not be as great a saint as that one over there, that one over there, but you know what? It doesn't matter if you're platinum or plastic. Hallelujah. So long as you're clean, glory to yes, God. As long as you're clean, God can use you. Yes. As long as you're clean, you can be part of God's household. Glory to God. But at the same time, it ought to encourage us to realize that we have no business sitting in judgment of one another. Amen. That's not our job. Amen. It's not our job to try to determine what kind of material they're made out of and what, whether they're fine china or whether they're simple plasticware. 
Lastly, this afternoon, I close with this, Romans 14 and 4, as well as verses 10 through 14. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou sin it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Tommy read this earlier. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. What is Paul telling us in Romans? He's saying, children, this is a personal walk. This is an individual walk. You know, what's unclean to you may not be unclean to your neighbor what is inappropriate for you may not be inappropriate for your neighbor therefore how on earth can we sit in judgment of one another when we're not all in the same walk we're not all having to follow the same identical rules there is no singular standard meaning god does not require that everybody in the house be fine china oh my lord have mercy. That's right. did you hear what i said God does not require that everybody in the house be fine china. But, listen to me now, but he wants us to aspire to be platinum. That's why the word of God declares, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. He wants us to desire to be the best. He wants us to desire to be the highest quality. He wants us to de he wants us to desire to be the most valuable. You understand what I'm telling you today. But in the meantime, in the course of your journey, if you're in a place in your life where you're simply plastic, that's okay. So long as you're clean, God can use you. Hallelujah. If you're in a place in your life where you're merely corral, that's okay. God can still use you so long as you're clean. If you're in a place in your life where you are only uh, earthenware. That's okay. So long as you're clean, God can use you. If you're in a place in your life where you're only uh, bone china, that's okay. So long as you're clean, God can use you. You don't have to be platinum to be in the family. You don't have to be platinum to be in the body. You don't have to be platinum to be in the house of God or in the household of our God. You just have to have a desire to be one day. Because, mm -hmm. honey, one day that's what God plans on doing with every one of us. Hallelujah. He plans on coating every one of us with platinum. Glory to God. So you better want to be platinum or else heaven's going to be a very uncomfortable place for you. Amen. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Praise God. Closing. In the end, it is the Lord who will hold his own servants accountable for their conduct and their labors. We have not been called to push out the plastic in favor of those who seem to live, <coughs> who better seem to live the Christian life. Who are we as one member of the body? Who are we? How are we justified in saying to a less valuable member of the body that they have no place in the body? Who are we to say to another dish in the household of our God that they have no place in God's household? 
We must all live according to our own convictions. And in the end, it is those convictions which will either justify or condemn us. Mm -hmm. I may not be fine china in the eyes of first church down the road, but it's not their call to make. Hallelujah. Amen. And even if I am not as glorious and as wonderful a Christian as some, the truth remains. Sometimes plastic works. Amen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes plastic works. Matter of fact, sometimes plastic is exactly what's called for. Glory to God. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Platinum or plastic? Amen. Mm -hmm.